Hey everybody, welcome to Bioenergetic Basics number 11 with me, Danny Roddy. And today we're going to talk about why baldness is not genetic and it's definitely not caused by androgens. The true method of knowledge is experiment by William Blake in memory of Ray Pete, raypete.com. This episode is brought to you by my course, which you can find on Patreon and Gumroad, which we'll talk about a little bit later. This episode is also brought to you by Keenogen's ProGest C, which Ray thought was the best progesterone product. So let's talk about today's outline for this episode. We're going to talk about the genetic androgen hypothesis steel man. So we're going to set up this theory as it is today. Then we're going to talk about the idea that it's an unsolved medical problem and how many papers talk about that. We're going to talk about the masculinity bias and why I think that's where everything went wrong. We're going to talk about how extremely pervasive hair loss is, too pervasive to be associated with genes. And then we're going to talk about the many paradoxes of hair loss. So neonatal male pattern baldness, menopausal male pattern baldness, and so on and so forth. So let's get to the steel man of the genetic androgen hypothesis. And this is a paper in 2016 by Rinaldi. And they say testosterone converted to the more active metabolism dihydrotestosterone through the work of the enzyme 5-alpha reductase plays a determinant role in the onset of hair loss in genetically susceptible individuals. And in 2010, Trub, his book, Aging Hair, he has a graphic. And here you can see the blood supply to the hair follicle, specifically to the dermal papilla. And this is providing oxygen and nutrition to the hair follicle. And it's very often stated that the dermal papilla is the heart of the hair follicle. And if this is smaller, the hair follicle is smaller and vice versa. And here we have an image displaying that androgens are are somehow affecting the hair follicle with question marks. <laughs> <laughs> and so there are hypotheses that the androgens are causing oxidative stress. And if you're in the Ray Pete bioenergetic world, you know that reductive stress precedes oxidative stress. However, I just picked this graphic to show that the theory of how this is happening is complete conjecture. And it has never been finished or offered some plausible explanation of how androgens are specifically attacking and causing the hair follicles to become smaller over time. So the steel man that I just mentioned of male pattern baldness is regurgitated over and over and over again. It's DHT bro or it's your genes, et cetera, et cetera. But some people might be shocked and find out that there are many papers talking about baldness as an unsolved medical problem in 2014, 15, and 16. So here we have a 2016 paper by Goffin, and they say treatment of hair loss is still an unmet need. Drugs such as finasteride and androgen pathway inhibitor are used for the treatment of androgenic hair loss, androgenic alopecia. These treatments have side effects. Finasteride causes libido loss and impotence in men. Glucocorticoids cause diabetes, weight gain, osteoporosis. And the problem of treating hair loss is far from being solved. And another one, by Jane in 2014, they say till date, only two FDA approved synthetic drugs, minoxidil and finasteride are used to cure androgenic alopecia with only 35 and 48% success respectively. Therefore, a search for a new drug based on the mechanism of androgen action is still needed. It is unlikely that single targeted agents will be sufficient for treating androgenic alopecia and therefore it would be a challenge to obtain compounds with multiple activities. This is from Brayjack also in 2014 and they say recent years have witnessed a considerable progress in the research focused on treatment of hair disorders, but with limited success. Therefore, one of the prime challenges of modern hair research is a more profound understanding of the molecular controls of hair follicle cycling. Common diseases such as alopecia areata, telogen effluvium, and androgenic alopecia until then will remain unsolved medical problems. So why is it an unsolved medical problem? We don't have time to get into it too much, but I think Merck ruined pattern baldness research. I don't think it would be as bad as it is now if Merck hadn't gotten involved. And that is a long story, and it's in this article from 1992 called Keeping the Pipeline Filled at Merck. I'll just read a little bit here. They say, every company has its legends. At Merck and Company, the latest is about Proscar, the new drug that shrinks in large prostates and is awaiting government approval. It involves a remote Caribbean mountain village with a population of male pseudo-hermaphrodites and an obscure medical paper about them. P. Roy Vegalos, Merck's chairman, seems never to tire of telling the story, and anyone inquiring about Proscar's prospects as the company's new billion-dollar megadrug is sure to hear about it from the Merck executives as well. And no wonder, since the ProScar legend says a lot about survival and the bare-knuckle competitiveness of the drug industry these days, illustrating how basic research and unrelenting patience must be combined to bring a drug to market. Aside from terminating effective hair loss research with the invention of finasteride and therefore supporting in a lot of people's minds that hair loss was, in fact, from androgens, I don't think finasteride works by inhibiting androgens. I think it has a different mechanism, but there's really no reason to not trust Merck. They're a good company 
aside from ruining pattern baldness research. Okay, so let's talk about the second thing that I think is a huge problem is the idea that masculinity was the real problem with pattern baldness. So here's a paper from Neves in 2014, and they say, current treatments are based on pathophysiological models, which have not significantly gone beyond Aristotle's observation that eunuchs do not go bald. This is partly because our knowledge of the pathogenesis is still meager and offers few rational targets for therapy. That's sad to see in 2014, because in 1942, James B. Hamilton, he's the guy that is probably the father of the idea that androgens cause baldness. And he was the first one to demonstrate in male castrates that if they were castrated at a certain age, they would never go bald. But even he did not seem as certain as people later that androgens were responsible for hair loss. And so here in 1942, he's saying the quantities of androgens prerequisite for baldness need not exceed those secreted by the testes of young adult males and are probably less in at least some instances. There is as yet, however, no proof that common baldness or unusually rapid loss of hair is caused by excessive quantities or unusual types of androgens. And also, the suspicion arises that androgens are not the directly causative agent in baldness, but only one member, albeit a frequently effective one, of a family of remote causes that affect local areas capable of reacting in a special manner. And finally, Hamilton mentions estrogen as a possibility. So he says, decrease in androgenic secretion can be attained upon administering estrogens, either as a result of inhibiting gonadotropic secretions or possible by direct antagonism between androgens and estrogens. But estrogens in themselves have been demonstrated to prevent the proper growth of hair. I think James B. Hamilton was doing the best that he could, given that it was 1942. But I think that Ray reframes something that's really entrenched in hair loss research, that testosterone promotes masculinity and estrogen promotes femininity. And in fact, estrogen, by activating the adrenals, can increase dihydroepiandrosterone or DHEA, and that can cause androgenic symptoms. We'll talk about it more a little bit later, but the man losing hair is essentially being androgenized and estrogenized at the same time. So the estrogen is activating their adrenals. Those are producing DHEA and the DHEA is being metabolized by the skin into androgens. And so this paper by Ditkoff supports what I'm talking about here. So they say, in conclusion, these data provide evidence that estrogen is at least one factor that influences adrenal androgen sensitivity and PCOS and may help explain the frequent finding of adrenal hyperandrogenism in this syndrome. And here's another one from Constance R. Martin in 1985. And she says, it was found that estrogens mimic testosterone, whereas DHT does not. The conclusion that estrogens are defeminizing agents is supported by several findings. So another very important aspect of this masculinity bias is that testosterone can be aromatized into estrogen, especially under stress. So this article from 2002, they say in males, testosterone is the major source of plasma estradiol, the main biologically active estrogen, only 20% of which is secreted by the testes. Of the factors influencing plasma estradiol levels, plasma testosterone is a major determinant. However, the age-associated decrease in testosterone levels is scarcely reflected in plasma estradiol levels as a result of increasing aromatase activity with age and the age-associated increase in fat mass. So here's the greatest paper I've seen in the last few years. This is from 2020. An alternative potential androgen-independent mechanism for female pattern hair loss phenotype deserves to be carefully considered, as well as a rethinking the identifying term of this type of baldness in estrogenic alopecia. So let's talk about another thing that throws people for a loop, but I, I think this is a very important element of the argument that stress and low metabolism is actually causing pattern baldness. But there's a series of papers talking about elevated DHEA or dihydroepiandrosterone, what we talked about earlier. And let's just read through these real quick and then talk about it. This paper from Pitts in 1987, they say 18 men aged 18 to 32 with rapidly progressive male pattern baldness had serum dihydroepiandrosterone sulfate and testosterone measured. DHEA sulfate levels were elevated in all patients. This study adds evidence to the possibility that hyperadrenalism may be an important element in the complex biochemistry of male pattern baldness. Here's another one from 1981. So before that, they said no correlation was found between the condition and circulating serum androgen levels. Urinary steroid measurements, however, established a positive correlation between the degree of male pattern alopecia and the level of dihydroepiandrosterum and also indicated a large number of patients had mild hyperadrenal activity. And then finally, the same thing is found in women. So they say the serum adrenal androgen dihydroepiandrosterone sulfate ranged from 2.2 to 5.8 micrograms per milliliter. And the normal female range was 0.3 to 3.2. All women had normal serum testosterone level of two women with elevated levels of serum prolactin. So what is going on here? Isn't DHEA one of the youth associated hormones? Isn't it supposed to be high? Isn't that good? I think the idea behind that will be explained by these next references. So Lardy et al. were the first people to speak of the detailed parallelisms between the function of thyroid hormone and the action of DHEA. In that regard, the key relationship between thyroid action and DHEA is they both stimulate thermogenesis. In relation to DHEA as an anti-aging hormone, we have to consider its potential as a stress modulating steroid. DHEA has an adrenocortical stress-mediated blocking action. These data show that DHEA 
H-E-A-S, concentrations increase in response to both acute and chronic repeated stress and provide another measure of HPA activity that parallels cortisol during acute response to stress, but diverges in chronic or repeated stress. The masculinity angle here is a huge problem. I think these side things that are rarely talked about from estrogen to DHEA provide actual clues of what's happening. And the idea that testosterone can be aromatized to estrogen, which is talked about very infrequently, I think to move along in the pattern baldness research and to discard the genetic androgen hypothesis needs to be jettisoned. So let's talk about the next reason that hair loss is not genetic and it's definitely not caused by androgens. It's that, and anybody with eyes can tell you that this is true, <laughs> that it's extremely pervasive. And we're going to get to some shocking quotes. So here we go in terms of saying there's a genetic susceptibility to baldness because everybody knows there is an inheritance of baldness. I'm not debating that. I'm just saying how that inheritance is happening. So here we have a paper in 2003 and they say the non-genetic causes of male pattern baldness have received little scientific attention. And even Hamilton in 1951, he said these genetic endocrine and aging factors are interdependent. No matter how strong the inherited predisposition to baldness, alopecia will not result if inciting agents such as androgens are missing. So in his castrates in Unix, it didn't matter how strong the familial inheritance was in their families. If they were castrated, they would never develop baldness. It kind of makes the genetic susceptibility angle a moot point, and it will become even more of a moot point after I read the next few references. I see so often, oh, it's genetic, it's genetic, it's genetic, but it's really a way of saying absolutely nothing. And, and here we have the godfather of the androgen hypothesis of baldness saying that it's basically a non-issue. One of my favorite references from 1996 by Guerrera, they say, as androgenic alopecia is a very common condition and displays a large variety in the rate of progression, apparently normal people may be in fact in early stages of baldness. And true of in 2010, they also say, although there is no precise statistics, the incidence of male pattern baldness in Caucasians is often quoted as approaching 100%. So as for how <laughs> baldness is developing through inheritance, I think we got to turn to Lysenko. And this is from a book in 1966, Cold War in Biology by Carl Lindegren. And I'll just read some quotes by him, but he says, knowing the course of construction of the heredity of an organism, it is possible to vary it directively by means of production of specific conditions at a specific moment of the development of an organism. And he also says, heredity is the effect of concentrations of the action of external conditions assimilated by the organism in a series of preceding generations. And Luther Burbank, who apparently said this 50 years before him, said it in a way more simple way. He said, heredity is the sum of all past environments. And so your parents, their grandparents, your transgenerational history, you're accumulating their environment and their health. If they have some susceptibility to some illness, if that is not broken within the chain of passing down a physiological inheritance to the offspring, that's going to continue. It can just take being in a better environment, better nutrition, supplementation, et cetera, to break the chain of events and improve not only that generation, but future generations. Also in Cold War in biology, they say towards the end here, the Russian Lysenkoists who claim that the nucleus is a purely epigenetic structure continually resynthesized by the cytoplasm. And I noticed that because I think that's exactly what's happening. <laughs> and I didn't catch that the first time I read this, but Barbara McClintock is somebody who Ray has mentioned very frequently. She says, in the future, attention undoubtedly will be centered around the genome and with greater appreciation of its significance as a highly sensitive organ of the cell, monitoring genomic activities and correcting common errors, sensing the unusual and unexpected events and responding to them, often by restructuring the genome. We know about components of genomes that could be made available for restructuring. We know nothing, however, about how the cell senses danger and investigates responses to it that often are truly remarkable. So Dennis Noble, in his book, I think it's called The Music of Life, he has a little graphic here. This is the central dogma of molecular biology, and it says that the genes control the proteins, which flow to the cells, the tissues, the organs, and form the whole organism. So information only flows one way. However, what's happening in the cytoplasm and outside the cell and the environment is actually having a reverse effect on the genetic material. So Dennis Noble says here that figure one has been completed by adding the downward forms of causation, such as higher level triggering, cell signaling, and expression. Note the downward pointing arrow connecting the proteins to the genes to indicate that it's protein machinery that reads and interprets gene coding. Loops of interacting downward and upward causation can be built between all levels of biological organization. So aside from the genes essentially being an organelle that can be changed depending on the organism's environment, one other concept that's useful to understand how inheritance is occurring is imprinting by Georgie Saba. And I asked Ray about this in 2018. I say, can we talk about hormonal imprinting, the basic idea behind a cellular protein being a protein in a cell that binds to certain substances while they can have an effect on other cells? And Ray says, Saba, who has done so much research on hormonal imprinting, has some evidence showing that the receptor is created specifically for what the cell is experiencing. And the reason why this is important in baldness, they say that the androgen receptor is a predetermined genetic 
genetic component of the cell. And so the, the genes are coding for the proteins and therefore the genes are eternal, the essentialism that Ray is always talking about and cannot be changed. So therefore how many androgen receptors you have is just your luck of the draw. But of course we know that's not true because so many things affect the concentration and sensitivity of androgen receptors. Georgie Saba's work is elucidating this through the things that he's talking about. Although imprinting is characteristic and inevitable perinatally, it can be provoked in any period of life in developing cells, especially at the weaning and adolescent age, late imprinting. There is no gene mutation during imprinting. However, the methylation pattern of genes changes and that inherits epigenetically the imprinting, which is manifested in disposition to diseases or in diseases, tumor formation, metabolic syndrome. Imprinting is inherited between generations that could cause, in the present chemical world, evolutionary consequences. So let's talk about the last thing, the many paradoxes of pattern baldness. E.T. Janes, they say a paradox is simply an error out of control, i.e. one that has trapped so many unwary minds that it has gone public, become institutionalized in our literature, and taught as truth. The first paradox, I think, is neonatal male pattern baldness, and this was first noticed by James B. Hamilton. He says the scalp in the first two years of postnatal life, soon after birth, a marked alopecia develops in the babies, in the same area that becomes bald in adult men, that is the frontal parietal and frontal areas, and even over the tonsure. This process continues for weeks or months and occurs in both sexes. While hairs are still being lost, new hairs appear on the surface of the scalp. By the end of the first or second year, most children have completely hairy scalp type 1 or 1A. So the next paradox is androgen insensitivity syndrome, where a person will have normal amounts of testosterone or DHT, but they'll have defective androgen receptors. And here in 2010, they say female pattern hair loss, also known as female androgenic alopecia, is generally regarded as an androgen dependent disorder representing the female counterpart of male balding. We describe female pattern hair loss occurring in a patient with complete androgen insensitivity syndrome, suggesting that the mechanism other than direct androgen action contributes to the common form of hair loss in women. The next thing is baldness in children. We report 20 pre-pubertal children with androgenic alopecia, 12 girls and 8 boys, age range 6 to 10, observed over the last four years. Baldness in polycystic ovarian syndrome, extremely common. So number five, we have pattern baldness post-menopause. So pattern hair loss in women is commoner than described, particularly after menopause. In the absence of other signs of virilization, male pattern hair loss would therefore appear to be a poor indicator of gross abnormality of androgen metabolism. And that was in 1988. Number six, we have the classic androgen paradox. And they say, based on these findings, DHT is held responsible for miniaturization of hair follicles and androgenic alopecia. However, as DHT is a more potent form of testosterone and androgens are expected to convert hair follicles from vellus to terminal, not the other way around, this interference gives rise to a paradox. In a review, Randall says, how one type of circulating hormone has such contrary effects on a single tissue depending on its body site is not clear. This biological paradox alone makes androgen action in hair follicles very interesting. And the last thing that's being covered up by my graphic here is changes with season. And so this is from Aging Hair again in 2010. And they say such a marked seasonal effect is quite remarkable. Nevertheless, the effect has a major significance as any new drug or treatment should be studied for at least one year to separate any effect from normal seasonal variations. So that's it for this first part on hair loss. And we'll get into a second part of what I think is actually happening next two weeks. And first we need to talk about the course. So I put together a bioenergetic basics course, and this is based on talking to many, many, many people over the last 10 years. And so I noticed that similar questions would pop up over and over and over again. And some of those questions, there was a lot to take in at the same time. Like for example, if a person's going to investigate taking thyroid, there are a lot of little things to know that if a person just didn't pay attention, they could cause some damage. And I got spooked so many times of people doing risky stuff with thyroid and different supplements. I thought maybe I just cement all these things that I thought into a course. And so I recorded this thing many times, but eventually got two and a half hours of material. And then I edited it down to about an hour and 10 minutes. It's very dense. And you can purchase this on Patreon and Gumroad. Uh, purchase it on Gumroad if you want to download it. I think it's like a four gig file or something. And if you just want to stream it, you can purchase it on Patreon and there'll be links below for this. And then this is also brought to you by Kenogen's Progesty, which is the best progesterone product according to Ray Pete in 2018. An unpopped popcorn kernel, you can put it on your finger and rub it into your gums and that's about five milligrams. And women are supposed to take this post ovulation from days 14 through 28. And if a man is using a very small dose, he can just use it indefinitely as long as it's having good effects. It's not interfering with his libido. But if you want to order this, you can email Catherine at Kenogen at gmail.com. Thank you guys so much. Really appreciate it. Two weeks from now, we'll get into part two. You guys are the best audience really from the bottom of my heart. Thank you guys so much. So much support for this show and I really, really appreciate it. Thank you guys. I'll talk to you soon. Peace out.